I have, I have a uh, plan worked out for tonight, and I, I have to be honest, it may not take us the full hour, so we may get to Compline a little earlier. Uh, I don't know of many people who jump on just for Compline, so I think we'll be safe in doing that, but we'll go through what I have. So just to recap a little bit, I think all of you were here last week. Yeah. We sort of talked through um, wisdom from different perspectives. We looked at uh, philosophy, we looked at psychology, <laughs> and we kind of ended up at, at religion, right? Which, go figure, we'd end up at religion, because that's where I can take it a little farther. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to look a little more at that tonight, and we're going we're gonna to jump into some of the aspects of it uh, within within scripture. Uh, eventually what we might end up doing, I don't know if, if this is where it's going to end up or not. I have a Bible over here that I'm looking at. We may, uh, we may dive into some of the texts themselves and just kind of go through it piece by piece, kind of like we, like we do Jim on Sunday morning. Um, kind of like we did with revelation when we did that class just to look a little deeper at it and especially at the wisdom aspects of it. But we're going to find out some things tonight that might surprise you in terms of, of who, what we think of or the people we think of when we hear wisdom and that wisdom actually gets granted to a few other people uh, throughout scripture. So we'll talk about that a little bit tonight. Book of Job too, that, that would be worthwhile to go through because wisdom, that's part of the wisdom literature. It finds its way in there a lot. Hello, Robin. Welcome. Hi. Thanks. Sorry, it's a couple minutes late. You're good. Now, here comes Carl. There he is. Hello, Carl. Hello, Carl. So Robin and Carl, you just missed my intro, so you're going to be lost the entire night. I promise you, you won't know what we're talking about now. I'm used to but being lost like that, so it's okay. <laughs> I bet it has something to do with wisdom. <clears throat> so when we look at religion, before we get into um, Judeo-Christian religion, let's look at a couple other things. Um, and I, I, can't I can't flesh this out for you other than give you some names that I read about. So if we look at uh, Indian religions, we have wisdom is, a, is a, a big part of that. And wisdom has a name, uh, names like Prajna and Vijnanya. And I don't know Indian religions well enough to tell you that. But if there are words for it, that means it obviously factors in in an important way somehow. Um, it is of central importance in Buddhist traditions. Uh, wisdom is very much a part of that. In Hinduism, wisdom is considered a state of mind where a person achieves liberation. That's a, a level of freedom given to those with wisdom. So big part in, in all of those. In Islam, we're going to get into the Abrahamic traditions. Islam, wisdom is considered one of the divine attributes. And interestingly enough, remember we talked last week about the, the, the word for wisdom in Greek and Hebrew and Latin. So if you remember the Hebrew word, does anyone remember the Hebrew word? Sirach. Sirach or something? No, it's Chakma. No. Ch chakma, you got to have that guttural sound. And interestingly, <clears throat> the Arabic word is Hikma. Hikmah, so it doesn't it doesn't uh, co go too far away from it. Um, the term appears many times in the Quran, uh, as I said, one of the divine attributes. So you find it there a lot. How many of you are familiar with the Quran? Do you have a copy of it? I used to. I don't anymore. I don't think. Kyle's thinking hard. You don't have to get it. I'm just wondering if you have it. Oh, yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a copy in my office, so it's kind of fun to go through it sometimes to, to look at the things that are that correlate and, and 
and it also helps you realize that Islam is is not, you know, what the world tends to see when we look at wars being fought in Afghanistan and mm-hmm. uh, in the Middle East. That that's extremist. Um, that's not the true religion. I taught a class a few years ago on Islam and Christianity, and I know Deacon Jerry taught one right as I was coming new to the cathedral. <clears throat> And you do find out you have so much more in common than you do different uh, for those who follow it to to the truest extent. And uh, Muhammad was very friendly towards Christians and Jews, what he called the people of the way or the people of the book. Um, And so that's something I think is neat to remember and to, to keep in our minds when we talk about when we talk about other religions. So now let's get to the Hebrew Bible and Judaism. We talked a little bit about this last week. This is an interesting fact. The word wisdom is mentioned 222 times in the Hebrew Bible. And remember when we did our study of Revelation, how numerology plays a big Mm -hmm. part in that. Uh, It does in some of the Old Testament stuff too. I don't know that 222 is a particular, it fits into that for any reason or not. That's not something that jumps out at me in <clears throat> numerological terms, but that's what it is, 222 times in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, wisdom is considered one of the highest virtues along with kindness and justice. <laughs> so I wanted to share with you something I found today. This is an article I came across in a, in a publication called The Voice. Biblical and Theological Resources for Growing Christians. This is an article written by uh, a man by the name of Dennis Bratcher. And he says this. I found it interesting. We talked, well, let me start by saying this. We talked last week about all the words that come to mind when we, when we hear the word wisdom, right? We kind of went through those. And, and so he, he pairs it down like this. He says, wisdom is really an approach to life, a way of looking at the world and for Israelites in particular, a way of living out in a very deliberate, in very deliberate and rational ways, their commitment to God. Wisdom is an approach to life and for the Israelites, a way of living out in a very deliberate, rational way, their commitment to God. While wisdom's roots go back to the early days of Israelite history, it began to flower in the latter part of the Old Testament period and flourished in the intertestamental period and the era of the New Testament, roughly 400 BC to 100 AD or BCE to CE. The wisdom perspectives did not replace the other two major strands of thought in ancient Israel, that of prophets and priests. It was simply a different focus that was complementary with the other perspectives. While it is easy for us to assume in reading the historical accounts of Samuel of Kings or the prophetic writings of Amos or Jeremiah that Israel lived in constant crisis (laughs) because they talked about those things. Yet, if we stop and think about the time span of the major upheavals in Israel's history, there were many periods of several generations at a time when there was no crisis. During those times, there was not great prophetic voice. There was not a great prophetic voice booming, thus says the Lord. There was just the daily routine of life that preoccupied most of the ordinary people of the land with the mundane questions of how to get along in life. Now, I don't know about you, but I read that and I thought, well, that's not very exciting. We want it to be exciting when we read about these things. We don't want to, we don't want to bring it down to what our actual life is right now. You know, I don't want to think that the ancient Israelites sat around and thought about, you know, how am I going to get along in life? But that's what it was about. That's what wisdom really was about. It was a, it was an approach to life. Well, you, I don't know if you've heard the, um, the Dalai Lama talk about Buddhism, but he will tell you, most people will tell you, Buddhism is not so much a religion as it is a way of life. 
it is a way of doing things, right? So that's why I think it's it's perfectly acceptable whether you're Christian or Jewish or Islamic or whatever religion to, to have Buddhist practices because you're not, it's not interfering with your own beliefs and religion. It is a way of life. It is a way of focusing your energies. It is a way of wisdom in a sense. Not I'm not, I'm not trying to say Buddhism is wisdom specifically, but wisdom does exist within that as wisdom, as we're being told here, is an approach to life. So there is wisdom in the way we approach things. And we, and we learn that through experience. Remember, we talked about that a little bit last week. We're always going to be better having gone through something before, knowing a little bit more about it, and can be wise in the sense that, that, that we know how to approach things, right? <clears throat> so here's what he talks about, at least Monday questions of how to get along in life. He says, these were simple questions of living. How to discipline an unruly child. How to teach children what they need to know to survive as an adult. The dangers of the community of gossip and slander. The need for hard work and providing the necessities of life. Why wicked people seem to prosper. The arrogance of sudden wealth. These are all life questions that most of us face today in the course of living. To realize that ancient Israelites faced these same questions and grappled with them rationally from the perspective of experience and community wisdom may say more to us today as modern Christians than we are used to hearing. Perhaps listening carefully to the wisdom traditions as scripture mm -hmm. may help us bring an earthy balance to our tendency to be preoccupied with the metaphysical and the supernatural as a way to live life daily. Isn't that an interesting comment? I want to give some time here if anyone has thoughts or comments about that. I mean, isn't that what Christianity in and of itself tries to do is give us a set of rules basically to follow to make sure that we are for lack of a better phrase, doing what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. No, oh, for sure. For sure. But what, what struck me so much, so much about this is the thought that, you know, we read these stories in scripture of, uh, of these, these Israelites in particular, I'm talking Old Testament specifically, in particular who, who did these great things, at least as they're recorded in scripture for us. And, and it just puts a whole different spin on it to think that they sat around on a Tuesday morning and thought, how do I get my child to listen to me? Or how do I, you know, how do I prepare them for the harsh world that's out there? I mean, I, they're 16. I can't afford a new chariot for them to drive around. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's what the whole Mishnah, Talmud, mm -hmm. uh, Tosefta really is, is, is how do we do the things that we're supposed to do and what do we do when we don't? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's that, it's that whole, that whole part of literature that we don't recognize really as Christians that really does get into the mundane, you know, how much does your cow cost? And what does that mean in terms of sacrifices to God? And how right. often do we do that? And so on and so forth. We're We were having a conversation. I was having a conversation. I, I want to say it was in the lectionary group, uh, which is the, our Tuesday night group that gets together. And Robin, I don't know if this was last night. It might have been last week. I don't think you were with us last week. No. Uh, no, no, Jim. It was Sunday morning. We're talking about Sunday morning. It was our Sunday morning formation class where we're going through the Apocrypha and we're, we've been in the wisdom of Solomon. 
And it was talking specifically about um, idol worshipers and craftsmen who would, you know, takes a piece of wood and make something out of it and then, you know, prays to it. And, and it's just a flimsy piece of wood, right? And that the boat that, that you build, and it talks about Noah in the sense that Noah knew it wasn't about the wood and the boat. It was about listening to God and what doing what God told him to do. And, and the boat, the wood didn't make a difference. The wood was just the means for you to, to, to be saved through what God told you to do. And so we had this whole discussion about Noah and being this good Jewish, I don't know if it was, I think it was Jeff the time about, you know, good Jewish follower of God. And I said, yeah, well, but you have to remember Judaism didn't exist yet. <laughs> Man, this is pre-Abraham. So we didn't really have all those, the, that that organized religious <coughs> aspect where then suddenly the 600 and what is it? 616, 618 rules came into play mm -hmm. and, and all this. It's just one guy trying to live his life, you know, day to day doing these mundane things and God, he hears God and God says, build this boat and do it like this. And he says, okay. And he said, we, we, we have to, and Kyle, I, this is a long way to get to your point. We do have to sort of separate the, the religious aspect of it and look sometimes just at the surface of, of learning how to live life in a way in a community that gets along with one another. And then, mm -hmm. then you put religion on top of that and you get these rules such as commandments or um, summary of the law or, you know, all these other things that, that then give that a little more perspective, right? And there's wisdom in all of that. But at the end of the day, people just want to know how to get along in a good way, not fight with their neighbors and, and know how to teach their children and, and, and live. Well, and if you think about some of the early letters to the apostles, they were all about how do how do how do we live in communion with each other as Christians, you know, and and kind of how to you know carry on your life. <clears throat> and one of the things that also in and wisdom plays into this too. Jesus. <laughs> When we get into the New Testament, I'm, I'm not going to spoil this for you, but I am, um, you know, <clears throat> the parables are, are, in a sense, a wisdom type of speech. They're not called wisdom literature, but they do sort of similar things that Proverbs might do. Uh, but, you know, you hear things like a king doesn't take his army into a war that he knows he's not going to win. You know, uh, you don't start to build fortresses when you know you're not going to be able to finish them. You know, basically things like that. And mm -hmm. I'd like to say, mm -hmm. even in the world today, at some level, if, if we would quit being obsessed with power and the need to control other people and just live our own lives with our own neighbors in our own countries... I think that would solve a lot of issues. Why do we have to take over other lands? Why do we have to, you know, why are we still in Afghanistan? Um, why can't we let them live their own lives? And and I know there's fear that if we pull out, then that means others are going to, you know, the Taliban's going to take back over. And I think that's always going to be a threat, no matter where you are. I did, I'm not trying to get political. I'm just saying I, that's where I don't understand the, the wisdom of living one's life, the, the, the idea that it's a, a way of living your life. Where is that in some places? And in and, and particular, where is that in, in ourselves sometimes? Okay, that was a rig. I was part of a discussion group this morning on uh, globalism uh, and how a large, large part of the discussion was how the world has seemed to have uh, uh, gone from... Uh, a mindset of globalism to nationalism, mm. um, and it's it, you know it's and, and yet you look at history, uh, the world is better in almost every respect 
when globalism is being sought out uh, economically, uh, peacefully. Uh, it, it, it just works better. <laughs> and yet we don't have enough wisdom to figure out that that's what we ought to be doing. We certainly have enough history to teach us that yeah. that should be what we're doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, all right. So back to this. And I, again, don't hear me trying to, I'm not trying to be political in any way. I'm just trying to say if wisdom is truly about living your life in a good way, why aren't we all better at doing it? Yeah. Um, That's what we keep trying to tell our son and his wife. <laughs> <laughs> So he, he has some points here. This, this author I was, I'm reading from it says, Wisdom is concerned with everyday life and how to live well. Wisdom is concerned with the issues facing humanity in general, the typical and recurring aspects of life that face human beings on a daily basis. Much of the rest of Scripture is concerned <laughs> with those unique events in history in which God reveals himself or God's self. Uh, in wisdom literature, there is little interest in history, politics, God who acts, miracles, sin, forgiveness, guilt. These things are not discounted, only that the concern is focused on daily living on what might be called the mundane aspects of life, such as raising children, providing economic security, finding an appropriate spouse, etc. So that's interesting. He also says wisdom does not appeal to revealed truth. Wisdom does not address the human condition from the divine perspective, but rather from the perspective of human needs and concerns, and in terms of what human beings can and should do to address those concerns. Wisdom attempts to give expression to the way things are. It is descriptive and not prescriptive. Describing and defining the world and the existing social order as a means to live within both in productive ways. He says, wisdom's claim to authority lies in tradition and observation. There is no, thus says the Lord, grounding of authority in wisdom thinking. Rather, the truth of life is already there in God's creation, awaiting discovery. That's pretty cool right there, I think. I love that one. The truth of life is already there in God's creation, awaiting discovery. Uh, then let me read you this part. He says, Israelite wisdom is rooted in reverence and commitment to God. The basic worldview of Israelite wisdom is that God is creator, both of his people and the physical world. Everything else in wisdom arises from this conviction. As creator, God has embedded truth in all of creation. Another way to say that it, that, uh, in all of, that all of creation reflects the wisdom, nature, and character of its creator. And therefore, all of creation is a way to learn about God and his purposes for the world, God's purposes for the world. Creation is truly a cosmos. Wisdom takes seriously the confession in Genesis that the created world is good. There is no hint of an evil physical world that would emerge later in Greek thinking. Human responsibility to God involves finding the truth of God in the world as reflected in how the world operates according to the harmony of its creator, and then living within that harmony of God's order. Uh, being wise is to search for and maintain the order of God in the world in order to live well as God has created humanity to live. A, quote, fool is one who does not recognize God as creator and therefore does not seek to live according to the harmony of God's creation. So that's another way of saying how can one live according to an order of something they don't know exists, right? Or something they don't believe exists. The way of wisdom is an ethical system in which humanity is responsible for searching, finding, and doing the things necessary to secure their well-being in God's world. So remember, this is all rooted in, in the Israelite worldview, in the, in the frame of mind coming from people of Scripture, right? So I found that interesting. Go ahead, whoever's going to say it. Oh, I was just going to say, I kind of disagree with some of that. That's um, fine. And especially where, especially where he's talking about 
evil wasn't introduced as it would be later assumed by the Greeks. Right. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to basically get it figured out in my head. So <laughs> on the first day that God, so in the beginning, God created is a faith statement. And I agree with that hundred percent. However, on the first day, God created light and dark. And that was the end of the first day. It does not say that in the Bible that the first day was good. Enjoy. It Peace. also doesn't say on the sixth day that that day was good. Um, sorry, there's, there is a book that I've read that really goes into in-depth on that. Um, and basically, it's that how do you, if God is all, if God is love and all loving, then how do you get evil out of an all loving being? And basically, the only way you can do that is if you remove that all loving being from the thing that is being created. And so you have this light that is the all that that is that being of love. And then you have the dark that's the removing of that being. Or the absence of that being, yeah. Right. Which yeah. then, which then allows human beings to have the good inclination and the bad inclination, which in Hebrew is the Yetzir Hara and the Yetzir Atov. And so I'm just kind of wondering what that has to say about it. Or if I'm way off base and gone down the crazy hole, because I do that sometimes. Well, I, I, I think you make a good point and I'm not gonna argue with the point you're making other than to say, I think we're, the perspective where this writer is coming from is simply to, to talk about wisdom specifically. Okay. To say that wisdom takes seriously the confession in Genesis that the created world is good. Wisdom is not seen in evil side, right? So it's not to say there isn't evil because certainly once Adam and Eve gain wisdom, they begin to have, you know, to see things in different ways, right? And then we have the sin of Cain. And then, you know, it goes on from there. And then we get to the Tower of, of Babel. And then we get Abraham, which some will argue is, well, that's really where Genesis is supposed to begin, is Abraham. Right? So I, I think from what I'm reading, he's just talking about wisdom on its own recognizes okay. the good. Okay. Right? Uh, um, but... Part of what I'm going to talk about later is that aspect in Genesis where Adam and Eve do do the act that they do. Okay. Well, and I would I would also argue that because I was actually just thinking about this is that without wisdom, you don't realize that there's anything wrong. Which is kind of the whole Adam and Eve aspect, isn't it? Right. So I think that that's also part of of this argument of good and evil is right. that is that they didn't eat from the apple of wisdom or the apple of knowledge they ate from the apple of the not well knowledge of good and evil and so <clears throat> until that there's no basis for what is good and bad for them no but <laughs> but then we're told the serpent was craftier than any other creature. But what we're not told is that the serpent was evil. Correct. Just that the serpent knew what this was and, and gave it as an offering, to, as an option to say, well, there's this that you could do, take if you wanted to. Okay. Like I said, I'm probably down the crazy rabbit hole. I do that. That's what, that's what, uh, Discussions are for, aren't they? <laughs> it's just to talk out those things. 
And that's not to say you're right or you're wrong or you're crazy or anything else. It's, it's sometimes just to talk out those things, which is great. So thank you. But speaking of Adam and Eve, get back to my notes here. When we think of wisdom, and we talked about this last week, when we when we think of wisdom in the Old Testament, I think there are two particular things that are people that come to mind. People may not be the right word. Figures that come to mind. Um, that being Solomon, and then the the personification of was of wisdom as the as the lady wisdom that we get in Proverbs. I, I and correct me if you think differently. Those are kind of the big things that might pop into your head when you think wisdom in the Old Testament. It doesn't mean there isn't wisdom anywhere else, because there certainly is, if it's mentioned 222 times. Um, <clears throat> but wisdom is attributed to other people throughout Scripture, right? And so, or not necessarily attributed to other people as it is present with other people around. And so, since you brought up the, the garden, you know, I will say in Genesis, it says that the the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. The tree of good and evil, it will allow you to gain wisdom, right? And I think, and so Eve takes of it, she gives it to Adam. And, and I think, you know, at some point, and it doesn't say this in Genesis, but I think at some point God had to feel like I was going to give that to you in due time. You know, why did you have, why couldn't you be patient uh, and, and enjoy this for a while? And then, but uh, we don't know that. I don't know that. That's not written in there. That's just something I speculate that, that may have been brought in good time. So I have a, I found a thing here that's talking about that particular incident. And it says, seeking wisdom is wise. However, some people will do anything to gain wisdom, even the wrong thing. In this case, Adam and Eve at all will realize it wasn't wise to not listen to God's wisdom in the first place. It was also not very wise to implicate another person. I guess that's it, Eve, or at the serpent. Take your pick. Um, but don't we know that it it wasn't not to listen to whatever parental person told us not to do something, whether that's our parents, whether that's God, whether that's our teachers, whether that's you know anyone. And and we all have a moment. I'm sure all of you can think right now where you said, yeah, I remember a time in my life, if I had just listened to what so-and-so had said, things would have gone a lot better. <laughs> but without that experience, you don't have that knowledge, and you don't have that wisdom. So maybe it was better for your life that you, you did experience it the way you did. I don't know. Sometimes we learn more from, uh, from not listening to the wisdom. So, yeah, I never thought of it that way, but And certainly, we, we, I don't think any of us would knowingly choose to do something against what somebody tells us if we thought it was evil. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Just kidding. E evil in the sense that it, that it would be harmful to somebody else. I don't know that we would choose that. Now, I, I think there are people in... in you know, people who have mental health conditions that can't that can't rash, reason that out or rationalize that. And, and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking that in a in a rational minded person, you're not going to choose something that would knowingly harm somebody else. I don't think, but that's me. I, I I I can't sense. I can't feel that coming from my own self. But we can say, well, I hear what you're saying. I agree with you, and that's probably the better way to do it. But if I do it this way, no one's going to get hurt, and maybe something better will come out of it. And then you learn either it does or it doesn't, right? 
And then you can teach that to the next generation who will then not listen to you. <laughs> and so it goes. But I want to talk about Solomon. And please interrupt me at any point in this if you have something you want to say or you feel I'm not making any sense. So we know Solomon. Why is Solomon attached to wisdom? Well, isn't that what he asked God for? God said, I'll give you anything in the world. And he says, wisdom. And so he gives him everything. Right. Right. So that's our starting point. And that comes in Second Chronicles. Chapter 1, starting at verse 7. And I'm going to read this for you. Kyle just summarized the whole thing, but I'm going to read it again. <laughs> that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, ask what I should give you. Solomon said to God, you have shown great and steadfast love to my father, David, and have made me succeed him as king. O Lord God, let your promise to my father, David, now be fulfilled. For you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before this people. For who can rule this great people of yours? God answered Solomon, Because this was in your heart, you have not asked for possessions, wealth, honor, or the life of those who hate you, and have not even asked for long life, but have asked for wisdom and knowledge for yourself, that you may rule my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. I will also give you riches, possessions, and honor, such as none of the kings who had, such as none of the kings had, who were before you, and none after you shall have the like. So Solomon came from the high place at Gibeon, from the tent of meeting to Jerusalem, and he reigned over Israel. Now, here's the interesting thing. Solomon was thought of as, as great and as wise. And, and it'll say often throughout scripture, there was no one as wise as Solomon. There's no one had the wisdom that Solomon had, right? And yet, was Solomon completely committed to God? No. No, Solomon still strayed. He still sinned. And and even David did too, although David, really, we only hear about one particularly bad thing. Solomon did a few other things, right? And yet Solomon had the was so wise as no other king was. So it's I find that interesting. That we give Solomon all of this power when Solomon did some things that probably he shouldn't have done. But let's let's look at Solomon. Any any thoughts on that? He did build a temple. Well, I there's a there's a story, and I kind of like it. Of, and I think it kind of gets to the heart of a lot of this. Is this rabbi is teaching a bunch of his pupils, and. One kid raises his hand and he says, you know, Rabbi, these stories are really boring. And the rabbi goes, what do you mean? And he goes, well, you know, the Greeks have all of their gods and all of their heroes and all of this. And, you know, they're fantastic. You know, the Iliad where people go on long journeys and all of that. And the rabbi goes, I see your point, but this is about real people you know and i think that that's just another example of you may have all the money in the world you may have all the power in the world you may be able to rule wisely and and know all the things but you're still going to mess up there's yeah. still going to be times where no matter what you do no matter who you are no matter where you go you're still human and you're still going to make mistakes that's what we have in uh in our own baptismal covenant in the episcopal church where it says not if you sin but when you sin 
repent and return to the Lord. All right? That's a good point. So we attribute wisdom to Solomon. We attribute the authorship of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes to Solomon. Uh, the apocryphal wisdom of Solomon gets attributed to him, although we're pretty clear, as Jim can it could fully explain and write a dissertation on right now, that that's probably not the case, but... It's a short dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, let me read this about Solomon. This actually came... Um, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to say, but this came off of Wikipedia, which when I was writing my dissertation, I was told uh, you're not allowed to use that as a source. So, <laughs> But I'm using it as a source right now. According to King Solomon, wisdom is gained from God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. That's from Proverbs. And through God's wise aid, one can have a better life. Also from Proverbs, he holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk, whose walk is blameless, for he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Solomon basically states that with the, that with the wisdom one receives from God, one will be able to find success and happiness in life. There are various verses in Proverbs that contain parallels of what God loves, which is wise, and what God does not love, which is foolish. And we talked a little bit about this last week, right? Um, for example, in the area of good and bad behavior, Proverbs states, The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him who pursues righteousness. In relation to fairness and business, it is stated that a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. These are a few examples of what, according to Solomon, are good and wise in the eyes of God or bad and foolish. And in doing these good and wise things, one becomes closer to God by living in an honorable and kind manner. King Solomon continues his teachings of wisdom in the book of Ecclesiastes. And I, I like this part, which is considered one of the most depressing books of the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Solomon discusses his exploration of the meaning of life and fulfillment. As he speaks of life's pleasures, work, and materialism, yet concludes that it is all meaningless. Yeah. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. I guess that's another translation for vanity. All is vanity. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Solomon concludes that all life's pleasures and riches and even wisdom mean nothing if there is no relationship with God. And Solomon is committed to God. I don't want to say that he wasn't, yet he did have foreign wives and he would pray to their gods too. <laughs> um, so anyhow, a little bit about Solomon. Of course, the we know... Probably one of the most famous stories of Solomon is the the one where he decides to, the woman comes with the baby and he decides to cut the baby in half, right? And they realize that their squabbling is not as important as the life of the child. Would he have done it? Probably not. <laughs> have we seen someone else do something like that? I don't know. I don't know that I'd want to see that. And then in Proverbs, we get Lady Wisdom. I want to read that part. So, Wisdom personified is feminine. We've been through that. The I read a whole thing talking about uh, probably one of the reasons for that is because the, the, the Hebrew word for wisdom is feminine. Uh, 
does that necessarily mean that that wisdom is 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 a woman? No. Mm -hmm. Does it necessarily mean that wisdom is is a man? No. I mean, it's just that's how it's personified. Um, but we do tend to, to to think that way, don't we? We tend to think of wisdom. We all, I think, in our own lives growing up, we think of wisdom as feminine. We we might think of the Holy Spirit as feminine in that sense. Um, I talked a little bit last week about the shack, didn't I? Where where the Holy Spirit is definitely feminine. It is, it is a female person, although God is feminine too, <laughs> which in that book is perfect. It's absolutely perfect. So let's read this part of Proverbs where that comes in. It's in chapter eight. And that chapter eight begins... Does not wisdom call and does not understanding raise her voice? <clears throat> On the heights beside the way at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries out, To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all that live. O simple ones, learn prudence, acquire intelligence, you who lack it. Here, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right, for my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. And it goes on, and then and particularly in starting picking up at uh, verse 22. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped. Before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above. When he established the fountains of the deep. When he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. That, to me, suggests more of wisdom as the Holy Spirit. Because even in scripture, we're told, you know, in creation when the earth was void that the, the spirit of God went out over the, the, ch the chasms there, right? The great deep. And so wisdom is linked with the Holy Spirit. Wisdom is also linked with Jesus in the sense that Jesus was the word, the created word that came forth, right? Jesus spoke it and it was created, which in John's gospel is, is frames the incarnation the word was spoken and it was created mm. i know you're all so mesmerized right now thinking of, of mm -hmm. proverbs and the holy spirit aren't you I'm, I'm gripped by it at this point i can tell mm -hmm. does this get into issues of, of the trinity then as to creation and, and begottenness and, and that sort of thing? From the standpoint of wisdom? Yeah, yeah. No. It, 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 if you're calling wisdom the Holy Spirit. In this sense, I think you could, you could say wisdom is the Holy Spirit. No, I don't think it takes away from that at all, because certainly if, if, if divine wisdom is the wisdom of God, then that wisdom is going to permeate all parts of the Trinity, right? Yeah. So that wisdom is going to be embodied in Christ and going to be embodied in the Holy Spirit. So it's not going to really make a difference one way or the other if you're referring to it in which part of the Trinity. Okay, yeah. You're getting confused though. Yeah, we're not, we're not try I'm not trying to get heretical here in any way. <laughs> okay. Well, and, and, in Hebrew, um, the Holy Spirit is referred to as um, or, or, ha, Kodesh, and it's 
literally translates to the breath of God. So when you're talking about things being spoken and things being created from the mouth, that's another image you can have. <clears throat> that, yeah, that God breathed, literally breathed life into creation, into beings, into whatever creation, right? Created order. Um, and that, that that spirit, that um, the Hebrew word nefesh, um, that was the, the I, I guess, sort of a soul, if you want to put it in those terms, was breathed into <clears throat> all of creation with the exception of plants. <laughs> and it's very specific about that. You know, all of creation got that breath, but not the plants. They're living. They just don't have that that same spirit or that soul. Something interesting. Let me see where we are in time. All right. So I did want to point out just a couple other things about other people in Scripture in the Old Testament. Certainly wisdom is attributed to Moses <clears throat> when you go through Exodus. Uh, in that account of, of, of the Israelites wandering in the desert as they go to the promised land, Moses doesn't get to cross over, but Joshua does. And so Moses lays hands on Joshua and Joshua is filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses laid his hands on him. So, you, so there's wisdom then imparted to, to Joshua as well. Um, we know about Solomon and Ezra. Ezra chapter 7, and you, Ezra, in accordance, in accordance with the wisdom of your God, which you possess, appoint magistrates and judges to administer justice to all the people. So Ezra is granted wisdom. And then Job, which is a part of wisdom literature, wisdom permeates that whole book, doesn't it? Uh, that's why I think it would be kind of fun to, to actually kind of go through Job and look at it. Um, Job asked the question in chapter 28, where can wisdom be found? And this particular thing says that is a legitimate question and there's only one real answer. God is most qualified to be the source of true or actual wisdom. God alone has the ability to rightly execute the right understanding of everything. God has to be the starting point and foundation for wisdom. And certainly it, for Job's case, that is true. And Job never takes that away from God. Job just is frustrated with God, but, but never gives up um, believing in God, never gives up his faith. He gives up his patience for sure. <laughs> and gives up a lot of, of his family and possessions and all that stuff. But he asked, where's wisdom to be found? And it, what's interesting, what came to mind when I was reading that bit out of Proverbs about wisdom saying she was there when God laid the foundations of the earth and and decided the depths of the seas and things and blah, blah, blah. Remember in Job, you get sort of a similar thing when Job is complaining and God says to Job, were you there when I did these things? Were you there when I planted the, the foots into the sea. Were you there when I did this? Wisdom was there, but we're, and I'm not saying God says that, but we read in Proverbs, wisdom was there, but Job wasn't there. I kind of like that section when God barks back. And I have to tell you, I, I had a, um, uh, we'll stop on this and, and forgive me because I'm going to use some foul language, <coughs> and sailor's language here. So, uh, when I was in Alabama, some that reading from Job was, came up in the lectionary and was there that Sunday, and someone had been at a different parish in another city. They came back with the bulletin, and it had the reading printed in it, in it. And, and it had a misprint, uh, and it was supposed to say something about 
you know, were you there when I planted this in the, in the depths of the sea? And uh, I can't think what the word now was. It was, um, I don't know if it said something about the ships of the sea, but what they wrote was the shits of the sea. And they thought that was very <laughs> appropriate and funny and, and sounded good for Job and at least made the reading that much more. <laughs> How do you answer that one? I don't know. All right. So we'll pick up next week with um, a little bit more of the Old Testament, and then we'll go into New Testament, wisdom in the New Testament, which is going to be relatively short, <laughs> <laughs> except for Jesus. And we can talk about Jesus all day long, but in terms of, of wisdom as literature types, it's going to be a short discussion. So, Thank you all. <laughs>